hearing Andy, you were speaking with uh, it reminded me actually of um, what took place in uh, California when uh, I think it was San Jose the I forget the railroad when uh, essentially corporation was given the rights of an individual for the first time and to my way of thinking that was uh, the linchpin up to that point, corporations, if you go back hundreds of years, it was just you know the, the collectivization of, of capital in order to be able to do something that individuals couldn't do. And going back to the kings, they had instituted corporations. Often part of their charter was that they had to be doing something that was for the, the, the general good, general purpose. And that has disappeared, uh, certainly in this country. And it has been institutionalized legally for over 100 years now, and it just continues to creep that way uh, when you see uh, the more recent uh, Supreme Court determinations as to you know freedom of speech and so on. And I think to to move in the directions you're talking about, you're going to have to roll back some of those sorts of things. And yesterday you spoke of, well, I'm going to talk about transitions. And maybe I'm just not listening well, but I haven't heard anything about transitions that, uh, particularly if you're looking at things globally, as opposed to continuing to maintain uh, national boundaries. Um, the ox that's being gored is going to be the impediment that you're going to have to address. Uh, and I think for those of us who are thinking, well, we should be changing things, we should be moving forward, it might be incumbent upon us to think about, well, if we're going to be looking at trying to provide some non-commodified aspects of life that we think of, are essential for everyone, um, the standard of living that we have enjoyed and can look forward to, particularly you know, our education and so on, um, we may have to be asking ourselves, well, would I be willing to give up? Would I be willing to share? Would I be willing to and, and look at some things where we would have less if we're going to be honest about this sort of thing? And I'm wondering about the, how you make these transitions in light of um, ox is being gored, the ox basically of those people who have the power to do something about it. And we sitting in this room often think, well, the folks that control the capital. Um, but if you look at it more closely and on a, a smaller scale, we control it too. We control aspects that may deny um, tens of thousands of children their lives every day in this, in this world because of starvation and hunger and disease. I think there's more. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Okay. Uh, I have a question about uh, how do you, how would you define the relationship between the, the commodification of the social life and the labor itself, the wage labor? I mean, the commodification and the commodification of labor. I think you moved a little quickly while you were talking about the uh, commodified labor to the issue of time because uh, wage labor exists today even among many forms, but, uh, but according to some time it's not always a commodity because sometimes it's convoluted with, with, uh, with rights and benefits and things like that. So how would you uh, describe the relationship between the two? And I also have an uh, anecdote to talk, tell you about the margins, the complexity of margins. You know, the best uh, how we are in the world comes from Caspian Sea. And a Turkmen friend of mine, which is right next to the Turkmenistan, is a former Soviet Republic. After the collapse of Soviet Republic, uh, the whole existing uh, fish eggs were, were harvested. So the caviar is more and more expensive after the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union because it wasn't uh, harvested in a plan way. It's really interesting that um, when you, are you speak up about a uh, social movements that are rising up against neoliberalism right now, you're talking about a lot of people that have generally been disconnected from capitalism, like the new freed labor that isn't being incorporated in. And I would like to hear more about what are um, the possibilities for workers to organize and to. Um, produce social change because a lot of the changes in this um, geographical division of labor, both in developed countries, the rise of the service sector, 
and in underdeveloped countries with the um, manufacturing going through all this fragmentation and subcontracting, this has made workplaces very small and very decentralized, and it's really, really hard to organize workers that are like that. And the most successful unions in the service sector in the United States are those ones where ownership has been centralized to a few, com to a few companies, but that doesn't look like it's gonna, it, it doesn't look like a trend that's gonna occur more widely. I think you had a question for Dan. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually just had kind of a comment to the gentleman who was mentioning it. it seems like perhaps our standard of living would have to decline, if not change radically, in order for people around the world to really to have what they need. If I if I'm summing that up correctly, um, and I think it's I think that's basically what we're told every day. Um, you know, you should feel lucky. You should really feel lucky for what you have, because look at all the things that you have and things that people don't have. And I really think that's um, something that's argued to us to keep us from aspiring to what we really deserve. I think there's more than enough of, to be honest, everything on the planet to provide all human beings um, with their basic needs, and a lot more than their basic needs, frankly. There's more than enough food to feed the whole world twice over. And I mean, it's documented in every way, shape, and form. They destroy food to keep the prices high. Um, I used to teach second grade, and I had 20 children, all of whom were black, all of whom were hungry, all of whom went without on a daily basis. And really, there was more than enough in San Francisco, California, frankly, five years ago, for all of those children to have everything they need. And if they had been given the things that they needed, guess what? They could have grown up to be things like doctors and lawyers and engineers and inventors. And in fact, that's what they said they wanted to be when they grew up. I think we throw the real potential resources into the garbage can by believing that there is such a thing as scarcity. The reality is there's tons of resources. It's really a question of how we use them and don't use them. And what we do is we throw resources like those 20 black kids half of whom will probably end up in jail, and some of whom will end up dead, in the garbage can, instead of saying, look at the valuable thing we have here, a human being. What is the real potential of that human being? And developing that to its fullest, and then I think we can fix almost every problem that we can imagine. David, would you like to uh, answer these and then take more? Maybe okay, come perfect. in now before I start forgetting. OK. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, the initial point about the corporation as legal individual, I still think, although it's got a sort of Canadian, set of Canadian twist to it, if you haven't seen it, check out the uh, video called The Corporation by Joel Beckham, which is precisely on this. He just traces all of the social, political, and economic implications of, create, of, the, of a corp giving to a corporate entity the rights of individuals and a very, very powerful uh, sort of set of examples that he gives of precisely what, uh, what you're talking about. I will try to come back in a bit to this question of transition because it, it relates to some of the other issues which have come up. And it's true, I think I did run a little bit too quickly through this business of decommodifying human labor. Because really what I'm saying is if we can imagine a social and political project which systematically expands the sphere of non-commodified consumption, what you are doing simultaneously is decommodifying human labor power. You are saying that there are certain social goods which are inherent entitlements. They come under the banner of social rights and access to housing and access to education and health care and food and so on, recreational, cultural goods. These are given rights in our society. And that, to me, is the undoing of the dispossession, which is at the heart of capitalism. And as Mark tells us over and over again, workers enter into this wage contract because there is no other way of getting the goods of life. They don't like selling the labor power. I suggested earlier, 
one society after another, people resist it, avoid it, do everything not to have to, have to enter into it. But there is a compelling economic pressure, the power of economic coercion, which is propertylessness, dispossession. And so fundamentally, when you make the goods of life social rights, you begin the process of decommodifying labor power. And that, of course, means that people once again become the managers of the economic system in which they labor. So thank you for kind of pushing me to, to spend another minute on that. Uh, on the, the question of labor in the North is really interesting. And you know, if I had the simple answers to it, uh, I think somebody out there would want to hire me for some purpose. But all I'm going to really give is, is a set of thoughts on it. One of the things that neoliberalism did was to both dramatically restructure the point of production itself, and part of that was what you referred to, trying to fragment units of production. Outsourcing contributes to that, even if it's not geographic reorganization of production chains, although that is part of the story, even when it is within the same nation state and you're simply fragmenting the units, making them smaller components rather than the great corp you know, the corporate model that grows up from both the 1920s onwards at least, of the large corporate enterprise that brings more and more subsidiary aspects of production into one large integrated enterprise. You're right, that proved during the upsurge of industrial unionism that if, you, if workers could figure out how to mobilize sufficient social power, man, that was tremendous to be able to organize these mass production facilities. <coughs> so partly what neoliberalism does do is to fragment and decentralize and break down uh, those relationships. There's no question about that. I personally believe that more significant in the global north is the destruction of the literal spaces of social organization. That is to say, to use these terms that have been used before, working class movements are formations. They're not fixed set entities. And they go through periods of composition and decomposition and recomposition. And neoliberalism accelerated a cycle of decomposition of older forms of working class organization. And I think there are all kinds of places where people have started to <coughs> grapple with that. New organizing strategies, worker centers that have much more active relationship to working class communities when it gets much more difficult to organize at the place of work, and so on. And one of the really interesting things, part of the backdrop to the story of Cochabamba in Bolivia, is the way in which it was actually the Manufacturing Workers Union the Fabriles, that, as Oscar Oliveira tells the story in the book, Cochabamba, they discovered the new world of work. They learned that actually there were more wage laborers in Bolivia than before, and in Cochabamba than before, and there were fewer large workplaces. And so the strategic problem became how do you begin to organize a working class that isn't structured the way it had been in an earlier period. And essentially, they developed a whole new series of organizing strategies to reach out to and to connect with what they call the new world of work, which they discovered was much younger and much more female than the world of work that that union had organized in the 1970s, for instance. And I think part of the great innovation of that movement was that it actually developed those kinds of organic links which made it possible to build a new kind of working class movement uh, precisely based on new strategies of organizing, new ways of relating. And as they talk about it, they argue, I think, in a really interesting way that these people have a working class identity, but it is not one based around the older working class organizations that grew up in a different period. So it's not that there's no working class identity and working class consciousness, it's just that it doesn't have the same institutional footings anymore. I think a lot of that is true in the global north. I mean, I certainly know in the city where I'm most politically active, 
there is really interesting organizing going on in the hotels, for instance, with very highly racialized workforces, okay, who have completely different relationships to the thing that when I came into the left, I called the trade union movement. That entity called the trade union movement barely resonates with them. But certain kinds of ways of doing working class organizing do resonate with them. And then the question is, can that transform and create a new labor movement in, in this period? So I think that's part of the story. I would also say, in terms of this argument that I'm making around decommodification, that I'm part of something in Toronto called the Greater Toronto Workers Assembly, and it's just basically a coming together of several hundred activists on the left from different social movements and so on. And we basically said when this crisis broke, you know, the left has got to figure out how to get together, organize on a much larger scale, and so on. And one of the things that the Greater Toronto Workers Assembly has launched is a free public transit campaign. And I had an amazingly interesting time before I flew into Madison on Monday, going to the Labor Day parade in Toronto and leafleting and getting into discussions with trade unionists from a whole variety of different sectors around this idea that we could completely decommodify public transit in Toronto. And it was I mean, quite fascinating. I've also had the conversations I've done leafleting at the uh, large bus and, and subway depots. I've had the conversations with uh, transit workers, bus drivers in particular, uh, which are really, really interesting. And what I have found is that people are hugely receptive to the idea. Question number one, where's the money going to come from? Okay, And that then, in our case, opened up a discussion. Well, it was interesting. I found $1.1 billion for security for the G20 summit that we apparently didn't have. You know, the cupboard was apparently better. And the amount of the bank bailout. We, just, we started to produce literature which compares the costs of free public transit with other kinds of spending that our rulers are doing. And also, we have a little research team that has discovered, much to our amazement, the numbers of cities in the world that either have fully free public transit, that's a very long list, by the way, or it is free at certain times of day in certain parts of the city, and so on, and then we discovered that in fact, coming up in a couple of months is a big conference in London, England, on free transit, the campaign that's being mobilized from the grassroots. So I choose that example not because it's the be all and end all, but there is a public good which whose reproduction has been increasingly borne by the fair paying individuals as subsidies from governments have declined throughout the neoliberal period. And to just even raise that question, and one of the things which is really interesting is that going into a whole variety of working class communities in Toronto is discovering how resonant that is, how much people spend on public transit day in and day out. So I just think there are even that in the global north there are also ways of, uh, of raising that. I think I won't say anything more for the moment. I know other people want to get in, but I've got one or two other things jotted down. I'll try to come back to. So. Okay, I think there was. You want to speak now, Eric? Okay. Yeah, so I waited. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just want to make one comment on the public transportation thing. Uh, a good argument can be made for free public transportation on purely market grounds. That is, you don't have to go outside of market logic. That is, markets only give you the right prices if there are no externalities. Right. So public transportation has huge positive externalities. The only way to internalize those positive externalities is by shifting resources from society to the transportation system. The only way, and that makes the price free. So you don't need a socialist argument. You can have a neoclassical economics argument. Uh, charging people for rides when the marginal cost is zero and where the positive externalities are big is economically irrational from a market point of view. Now, it turns out if you really take seriously the notion of externalities of individual market transactions, public transportation is a kind of paradigm case, but a vast array of market activities have positive and negative externalities, which means that even interior to the market logic, the prices are not signals. Right. Now, that then, the, I think there's a tension in your exposition. I, I don't disagree with the bottom line of it. I mean, I think we, 
the, the ideal of a democratically a democratic socialist egalitarian society is one to maximize the space of decommodified activities and then it's an empirical question what the residual is it may be not so small it may be tiny that's not so much the issue but in your account of the way corporations behave you already indicated that we're actually not in a market economy that is since they don't respond to price signals already it isn't the case that we're in a market regulated economy so it's not a question of moving from a market regulated economy to something else we're not in a market regulated economy if you define a market regulated economy just in terms of how salient are the price signals in the individual choices we're in a different kind of economy we're in an exchange based economy which has market like aspects in which markets are multi-dimensional phenomena they're not just price signals there are other things too and some aspects of markets are present and some are not in different parts of our economic life now if you treat markets as this multi-dimensional phenomenon rather than binary you either have them or don't you either have price signals or you don't have them then it's a more complicated question what the social what it might mean to talk about market socialism since market anyway is a multi-dimensional idea uh, and I don't have an answer to this I my solution is to move and try to develop the concept of hybrids to get away from binary notions of market or non-market whether the non-market be democratic planning or central planning but rather just to think of um, there being multiple principles in play and for any given kind of productive problem different hybrids will be the ideal uh, I don't think a public library system for all to access to all things would be a good one uh, but it's a good one for a lot of things beyond books uh, so I, I mean this is not so much of a question as just a framing of the agenda I, I, I think the hybridization perspective which sees markets as multi-dimensional and democracy is multi-dimensional and you want to figure out how to reconfigure these different dimensions in new ways you get new configurations <coughs> in which the democratic principle then becomes ever more central to overall social life without knowing in advance exactly where the boundary conditions are for that there was one hand and then uh, there was one hand and yeah, uh, I just had a question about the whole toothpaste example. I um, thought it was really interesting what you said about it. I, I was just trying to, after you said it, I couldn't get out of my mind like how um, how exactly you, you mentioned choice and I didn't want to go through the whole choice on, uh, argument. I'm kind of a newbie here and I'd like to hear that argument, but uh, just for fun. But I think what's more important maybe is. Uh, what kind of institutions do you see um, uh, making these sort of decisions? I guess not necessarily how many choices we have, but how we how we make them. Who makes the decisions? Um, I, I guess when I was thinking about that, is it you know, 17 brands or three brands that are you know sanctioned to run by the state under certain parameters or or, or under a certain organization? I, it kind of reminded me of the whole healthcare debate and the uh, different plans of are we going to have, you know, is it like one plan and then you can opt up or there for other outside independent groups that are running by themselves. I think a lot of other countries in uh, Northern Europe in particular have such things or is it, one, you know, just one toothpaste, you know, you can kind of see what I'm saying here and how, how we get to those sort of structures and if it's toothpaste is way down the line or what what are sort of the next steps maybe we're at healthcare today um, but what what's tomorrow and when is toothpaste mm -hmm. yeah, w one quick thought that popped in my head after what uh, you were saying over there is that I, I think that what David was noting and the starting point for the question of the market to begin with is seeing it as Marxist as such social relations more than just any individual factors that find um, those various things. So I think the binary that you're talking about breaks down if you view it as far as social relations, like who has the actual control over what what decisions are being made. So that's just that's just a thought. But what I am um, 
what I, what I wanted to ask as far as questions go is that uh, I just read through um, an article by Jeff Weber, who I think that you know a little bit, um, mm -hmm. in the new International Social Review about Bolivia. And uh, you know, some of the some of the things that I think are most interesting about it is that this is one of the places where the new socialism is being talked about, and uh, Evo Morales is professing to be uh, you know building this sort of socialism for the 21st century in the same way, perhaps at a different tenor, but in the same way that um, you know Hugo Chavez mm -hmm. is. And the, the stuff that he goes through that I think is very interesting is the degree to which there's a continuity between the neoliberal nostrums that kind of define a lot of the um, you know IMF plans of the past, but now. He's able to command a sort of popular um, enthusiasm that got him to office, but since he's sitting in office now, accepting a certain framework, he's being forced into you know privatizing a whole number of things. Uh, and uh, there's some statistics in there about the, the degree to which the state sector is actually you know smaller than it was at other points. So I think it's useful. So there's that on the one hand, but then on the other hand, you also have an opening up of um, actual discussions at the base around what socialism actually means for the indigenous community, what it means for the working class community in, in Bolivia. And he's talked about in other places that you know the first set of struggle against from the left against um, some of the, the market induced uh, aspects of the program. So I'm curious if you could just comment about how that dynamic works in the way that uh, you know we should we should uh, look at that. And then um, the uh, the second question, when you're when you're when you're talking about the landless movement in Brazil and the various other examples of dispossession fueling sort of uh, mm -hmm. revolt, it reminded me of Trotsky's view of combined and unnamed development and the way that has an effect on people's consciousness, folks being the whole social existence being thrown into the air and accordingly becoming open to a whole number of other um, alternatives. So uh, I'm just curious what your thoughts are in terms of how that works in you know. It, it, that this possession isn't just going on in the developing world. So, what does that mean for? Anyway, is that so relevant? Yeah. You um, you also mentioned that okay. I mean, the, almost all of the examples that you were given about things where where anti neoliberal movements are taking place are almost almost entirely dispossession or like what might be more like political in terms of it's not the market as such that slowly. Uh, Extracting surplus, but it's like a, a more political force of directly closing off the common. And I'm curious, I mean, how do you feel like, uh, as a critique of wage labor, where that comes into this? I mean, because it's, to some extent, it's a little bit opportunistic to wait for dispossessions or closing off the common to, to make some kind of thing. Um, and the, the point of production uh, has become strategically less viable because of the restructuring and things like that is a difficult problem, but it's going to be a pervasive one that hypothetically you could get a golden age of capitalism for 30 years where there's little to no dispossession, but wage labor would continue to expect surplus. And so I guess I'm kind of curious how you feel like that is coming in. Like if your strategy for, for decommodifying things is an indirect way of making people less dependent on wage labor by saying like, but if you don't need to pay for transportation, you don't need to work as hard to pay for the bus. Um, I mean, I can see that as a unifying thing, but it seems that that constant problem will remain so long as, I mean, we live in, in a capitalist system. Like, you know, dispossession will occur from time to time, but hypothetically, like, you know, in five to ten years, this process of dispossession that we're seeing for closures and, and the gutting of uh, social spending right now could be done, and that this will just be what we've got left and continue to work as we do. So I'm curious about what your comment is about how we actually focus in and what that for us. Is that it? Really? So you can answer. Oh, well, oh, maybe yep. one more. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just, if it's short. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I really like um, what you were saying about you know, these movements in like, the Zapatistas or in Bolivia as described as movements against commodification. <laughs> Um, and you know, in response to the injustices that are created by that commodification, um, and it made me think about uh, about reform struggles, you know, in the United States, which aren't necessarily in response to commodification that's being imposed on us. Although that's something that's happening, but also in response to the effects of the commodification that already exists. The fact that you know, house, housing is a commodity, and that this this whole system was was the housing system was disrupted by uh, the financial crisis and all the speculation. Um, and the way that sort of the, the importance for people engaging with um, you know, the idea of socialism 
and we wanted to win others to that idea, the importance of engaging in social struggles that seek to fight against the, commod you know, the commodification of life. You know, you know, the movements um, that's, you know, counterposed to, you know, housing um, as, a, as a commodity, they say instead housing is a right. Housing is a human right, or healthcare is a human right. You know, the importance of being involved in those struggles and organizing and winning those struggles, um, the effect that that has on people's ideas about the rest of society. Um, because I think that that's, that's sort of what, what, what you were getting at, that I think that the, the effect of, uh, of organizing um, in response to the fact that our entire lives are commodified under capitalism. And when you have these periodic crises, like we talked about yesterday, um, that becomes more and more clear to people that the, you know, the inadequacy of that system, that's, that's the basis for our organizing and challenging. Um, you know, not just the immediate injustices that exist here with housing or healthcare or whatever, but ultimately the whole system and trying to connect those all together is I think what we need to do um, when we talk about socialism for the 21st century. Okay. Yeah. Once again, I'm just going to say that uh, these are very rich, challenging discussions and uh, I'll you know, scratch the surface of some of the issues that have been raised. I know some of you will get a chance to really go at me tomorrow in the uh, <laughs> seminar setting, so I'm sure some of this uh, will be revisited there. But I'm going to start with the question that you raised about choice, because in many ways it's the key to much of the sort of ideological appeal of the market, and interestingly it relates, I think, quite directly to something that Eric was bringing up around this whole business of externalities. In this sense, that the classic consumer sovereignty choice model says what we get is what we choose. The consumer is sovereign. The products that we have out there and the economic outcomes are the result of the aggregate of all the individual choices that we make as consumers. No one forces us to buy X or Y or Z. It's a free act. It's an exercise of our own choice. Now, the critique of that has always operated on a number of levels. Uh, first, that it doesn't actually describe how products are created and developed at all. In fact, the history of capitalism is very much one of closing off a whole series of choices so that all you have are the market products. Okay, one of the key <coughs> things about capitalism is precisely in terms of this argument I was making about dispossession, is you deprive people of customary ways of satisfying needs, which is why, as Marx spent so much time on in Part 8 of Volume 1 of Capital, the destruction of the common land system was so crucial. So long as peasants could go onto the common lands to fish, to hunt, to gather wood, to pick berries, to get straw to make baskets and beds and so on, so long as all of that was available to them, they were not market dependent. They were not dependent on the market as the only social space in which they could acquire the means of life. And so what's interesting, and that's one of the reasons why some of these examples I was using earlier are so resonant, that when we, when we don't have to just refer back to history, but we see this process of dispossession happening today, I think it allows us to think about the whole history of capitalism as one that in fact was designed to close off the choice to live in certain ways. It's why in Marx's description is beautiful, but later historians have come along and trace it over and over again. There is a war that is waged across the English countryside and in the cities that goes on decade after decade after decade as these dispossessed peasants try every other scheme beyond wage labor to stay alive. Squatting. Okay, they move back into the enclosed forests. This is where all the Robin Hood imagery develops. They go back onto the, what used to be the common lands and are now enclosed forests, and they squat. And they arm themselves, and they fight back. And then the diggers during the English Revolution who go out on uh, property, and they start to dig, to build housing, and to build communities, and all of this. So that's really the first point I want to make, is that choice is a very relative thing here. And certain choices about how to reproduce your life get closed off. 
uh, and this is essential. But then there's Eric's point about externalities. All of the commodity decisions that we make have all kinds of effects beyond that immediate transaction, that exchange, exchange transaction. And in my book against the market, I, I just I quote a, a wonderful passage from a couple of welfare economists who say that this idea that the economy can be understood as an aggregate of individual choices, and that's the key thing. Um, the, the ultimate logic of it is this, as he points out, if the environment is being destroyed, if housing and health are inadequate, while deodorants and hairsprays are abundant, or if products are unsafe, it is because people, quote, want it this way. Uh, and you know, that, that is a claim. And I think the really, most, really important thing for us in challenging these arguments is to make clear that no one is giving anybody the choice about adequate health or adequate housing and so on. Um, and so I think, you know, in terms of the really important point that you raise around choice, that's sort of the first cut uh, response to it. And that really leads me into, because you know, Eric is absolutely right, and it's something I didn't get a chance to adequately elaborate on. I'm engaging this discussion around market regulation for two key reasons. Not because I think everything is governed by price signals, but the market socialist model emerged with the claim that only that provides efficiency for allocation of resources. But also because I insist that the one thing which remains enduring throughout the capitalist economy is that human reproduction is subjected to market dependency. And that's why, going back to the last, to this last or second last point, which I'll, I'll try to come back to, um, that's why if you look at the history of working class struggles, it's, they're, they overwhelmingly come back time and time again to trying to offset the effects of the commodification of human labor power. To either through trade unionism, trade unionism and collective bargaining, or through the fight for social programs, to get aspects of human social reproduction that don't rely upon the market, that are excluded from the market. And that what I'm really trying to return to here is that crucial question of dispossession and market dependency. I think that's where the market imperatives are imposed on working class people all the time. And what you see is an inner logic of working class struggle, which is to break free of that commodification of their of their human capacities. And so Eric, on that point, I use a slightly different language when you talk about multiple principles, but I, I think that idea, I, what I talk about is different economies. In other words, the capitalist system involves the single economy of time and socially necessary labor power, whereas in fact, for human and environmental reasons, there could be all kinds of reasons for choosing the least optimal, if optimally efficient production system, for instance, because it is more humane, because it is more ecologically sustainable, and so we're talking about different economies rather than a single metric, which is organizing everything. So I think we're using slightly different languages here, uh, really to talk about the idea of an economy freed from the imperatives of capital in which diverse values could inform democratic economic decision making. Uh, rather than a single economic logic. Um, yeah, two other quick points. The Jeff Weber work that you refer to, uh, I just recommend it to everybody, Jeffrey Weber's stuff on Bolivia. It's appeared a lot in the Journal of Historical Materialism. There, the book will eventually be out at an affordable price. I still think it's the best account of the, what he calls the cycle of revolt from 2000 to 2005 in Bolivia, uh, Jeff's book is called Red October, and I will admit I have just recently blurbed um, his forthcoming book with Haymarket called From Rebellion to Reform uh, on Bolivia. So yeah, I, I really do want to recommend Jeff's work because it, I, I've learned so much uh, from it. But really the final point on all of it is, you know, points that have come from a, a number of comments, which is, as I say, I think that 
this period that we're now in is one in which we're going to see this continual conflict over the logic of commodification and privatization on the one side and the logic of certain kinds of struggles that resist that drive and that imperative. And the way I tried to articulate it in my historical materialism piece was to say that we're essentially getting the conflict between life values, which are highly diverse, and value as it operates under capitalism. And I think that's a sort of framing device that I think can be used when we're talking about uh, socialism for the 21st century. Uh, but as I say, I know you'll get lots more chances to have a go at me on some of these things tomorrow. So thank you for your attention and your amazing audience. <laughs>